Welcome again, dear friends and listeners to Pulmonology Read Aloud. My name is Dr. Anshama Neja Arora and Pulmonology Read Aloud is back with another quick topic in respiratory medicine. This topic is a follow-up of one of my previous videos where I talked about autoimmune rheumatic ILDs and their management guidelines. This time, we are going to talk about the doses, monitoring and side effects of the most commonly used immunosuppressants in autoimmune ILDs. We know which medicines are, which drugs are preferred and which ones are additional. However, when it comes to prescribing these drugs, we often get confused as to the monitoring that needs to be done in them. So in this quick video, let's understand that. Let's talk about azathioprine first. You would have heard in my previous video that azathioprine has been found to be as effective as most of the other immunosuppressants used for autoimmune ILDs. But the major problem that it has faced in a lot of clinical trials is the problem of adverse effects. So how do we deal with that? Azathioprine has to be started in a dose of 50 mg per day initially. It should be gradually increased to a final therapeutic dose of 2 to 3 milligrams per kg per day. That means for a patient who's 50 kilograms, the final dose will be 100, so will become 50 milligram twice a day. And for a patient who is 100 milligram, the dose could be around 200 milligram, so 100 mg twice a day. So this is important to start slow and then gradually increase. What tests are to be performed on follow-up? We do a CBC with differential at baseline. Since the most common side effect is, L is a derangement in liver functions, so LFTs should be done two to three weeks after starting the drug. And then after any dose increase in two to three weeks, you should repeat them. Once the patient is on a stable dose, ask him to do a liver function test every three months. So what are the side effects one commonly looks at? It's hepatotoxicity, leukopenia, and rarely pancreatitis has also been reported. A lot of GI-related side effects have been reported and usually result in patients opting out of the drug. The second drug that we'll be talking about is mycophenolate. Mycophenolate is available in two forms, mycophenolate mofetil and mycophenolic acid MMFS. MMFS is usually better tolerated by most patients, but the dosage of both the compounds is different. MMF is started with a dose of 500 mg per oral twice a day. You can gradually increase to a therapeutic dose of 1000 to 1500 mg twice a day. This can be achieved by giving the patient two tablets of 500, which is 1000 mg morning and evening, to a total dose of up to 2 grams twice a day, which has also been used in a lot of trials. When we look at MMFS, the starting dose is 360 mg per oral twice a day. We gradually increase this to a therapeutic dose of 720 to 1080 milligram twice a day. So again, two tablets of 360 can be given BD for a final therapeutic dose. How do we monitor? We perform CBC with differential and a comprehensive metabolic profile at baseline. This means doing a sh blood sugar, liver function test, renal function test, and electrolytes because it has been seen that mycophenolate can also cause metabolic derangements. Once you do a baseline test, after two to three weeks of starting, you should repeat these tests. And again, after any dose increase, just like others, you should be repeating this test. Also, once a patient is stable, every three month follow up with a repeat and test is advisable. We should also ask the patient for a full body skin examination, preferably by a dermatologist annually. Now, when we talk about mycophenolate, the common side effects that one can expect is marrow suppression, hepatotoxicity. There is a black box warning regarding not using the drug in pregnancy. The most common side effects are gastrointestinal and bone marrow suppression. 
So since bone marrow suppression is a common side effect, make sure you ask the patient about blood tarry stools, uh, about bleeding gums, or blood in the urine or stool or bloody or cloudy urine every time that the patient visits. The third drug is rituximab. Now, rituximab is given IV in the dose of 1 gram every 2 weeks for 2 doses. So, 1 gram IV for 2 doses, 2 weeks apart. It can be repeated every 24 weeks as needed. Here, we have to be careful about coexisting infections or opportunistic infections. Here, hepatitis B virus infection, hepatitis C virus infection and latent TB screening must be done before initiation. Also, a CBC with differential count at baseline and then at 2 to 4 monthly intervals is recommended. When the patients get the infusion, we must keep a monitor on infusion reactions. A lot of patients complain of deterioration after rituximab because of a severe infection. We've seen many patients with infections like PCP, infections like a severe viral infection or pneumonia post rituximab because of immunosuppression. So this is something that has to be closely looked at before you give the patient the dose. So common side effects are cytopenias, infections, reactivation of hepatitis B and there's also a black box warning for progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy with rituximab. Coming to the next drug, cyclophosphamide, it is an additional drug for most SARD ILDs mainly because of the side effects although it's as efficacious as most other immunosuppressants and was often used as a first line in the past. So, it can be given IV and oral. IV dose is 500 to 750 milligram per meter square body surface area. Oral starts at 50 to 150 milligram per day. The target dose is 2 milligram per kg per day. Maximum dose is 200 milligram per day oral for six months. Some experts also in this guideline statement have recommended a maximum dose of 100 milligrams daily. What have to be monitored? CBC with differential and also very importantly, urine analysis every four weeks. So every month for the first six months. When you give oral dosing, you do a CBC with differential almost after a fortnight after starting the drug and then every 10 to 14 days after any dose increase. Once he's stable, ask him to do the test every month. A urine analysis must be done every one to two months on stable dosing, whether IV or oral. And once treated with cyclophosphamide, an annual urine cytology is very important. Why is it so? Because we have to look out for marrow suppression. Patients can experience infertility, so we have to be careful in young patients. Hemorrhagic cystitis is one of the most noted complications and has to be looked out for. Need for pregnancy avoidance because of teratogenicity. And in long term, because of the risk of malignancy, including bladder cancer, annual urine cytology is recommended. The last drug that I'll be talking about is tocilizumab. The dose is 162 mg subcutaneously weekly. Again, because of its immunosuppressant profile, a latent TB screening should be done before initiating. Must do a CBC with differential at baseline and after 1 to 4 to 8 weeks or 1 to 2 months of starting therapy and 3 monthly thereafter. A liver function test becomes very important here at baseline and every one to two months for the first six months and three monthly thereafter and a lipid profile also. What are the side effects we're looking at? Transseminitis, hyperlipidemia and also instances of bowel perforation. So make sure to ask patient about pain in the abdomen. So as we see, most of the immunosuppressants have to be monitored one to three monthly 
in the first six months and three monthly after stabilization of dose. It's very important to be mindful of the side effects when we are prescribing these immunosuppressants. That's all from Pulmonology Read Aloud. I hope you like this short version of the doses of immunosuppressants in SARD ILDs. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Thank you and happy reading.